In the next 13 minutes, I'll teach you how to perform a rapid but complete lung ultrasound exam for the critically ill patient. We'll cover three important aspects of lung ultrasound, including lung anatomy, ultrasound artifacts of the lung, and lung pathology. Let's start with the anatomy here. Here's an illustration of the chest wall, including skin, ribs, intercostal muscle, and visceral and parietal pleura that are touching each other. This will be very important when we perform lung ultrasound. Here's an ultrasound image with a linear probe at the same location indicating skin, and we have some muscle here, intercostal muscle, you have a hyperechoic rib with a shadow behind it, same over here, and finally you have your pleural line, which shows that the visceral and parietal pleura are touching each other since you see movement along this line. The other important anatomical area will be the costophrenic angles bilaterally. This is a left upper quadrant view where you'll notice that there's the spleen, the diaphragm, and here is going to be normal lung in the costophrenic angle. And you'll notice that the spine disappears behind this dirty shadowing that the lung will produce, and that's normal. Here's the corresponding ultrasound image with the spleen, the diaphragm, the costophrenic angle that's normally filled with an air-filled lung. And you'll notice that the spine or the vertebrae is present here, and it will stop at the diaphragm due to the dirty shadowing from the lung here. So which probe should you use for the lung exam? Well, it all depends on what your clinical question is. We'll go through the three most common indications for lung exam next. To evaluate for a pneumothorax, you're going to want to use the linear probe. The patient should be completely supine, and you're going to place the probe on their anterior chest and slide the probe down the midclavicular line bilaterally to evaluate for a pneumothorax. This is because air rises to the top of the chest, so when the patient is supine, it should be just underneath the probe. However, if you're evaluating for a pleural effusion, you're going to want the patient seated upright or nearly upright since the fluid will gravitationally flow to the bottom of the lung cavity, and you will visualize it here on the costophrenic angles. And finally, if you're evaluating for pneumonia or pulmonary edema, you're going to want your patient in an upright or semi-recumbent position. You're going to have to evaluate more lung spaces, and you'll use a curvilinear probe. The most common way to evaluate lung spaces is to break the lung up into three lung zones using the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line as boundaries between the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior lung zones. So there are six lung zones total, three on each side. Our second topic will be ultrasound artifacts of the lung. This is going to be incredibly important to understand since you're going to use artifacts to actually interpret your images that you obtain. The most common artifact will be the reverberation artifact. This occurs because there are two bright reflectors on this image. There's one at the pleura lung interface here, and then there's another one at the skin transducer interface up here. So when a sound wave is transmitted, it hits this interface and a portion will be transmitted through this interface, but then there will also be a portion that gets reflected back to the transducer. This occurs at this interface as well, and then again and again. And notice each subsequent echo is of slightly weaker intensity. So what does this mean? Well, the ultrasound machine will see the normal tissues up here that we already described, but at the pleural line, there's going to be a reverberation artifact that occurs the equal distance down below the pleural line, which we call an A-line. And this is again repeated to a weaker degree down here. This is another A-line. These are completely normal and they indicate a normal dry lung. So if we use the term A-lines, we see bright horizontal lines of decreasing intensity down the screen, indicating a normal lung. This is opposed to the B-line, which indicates a wet lung, which we'll go through next. These bright hyperechoic vertical lines at the pleural interface are B-lines, and these are lines that indicate a wet lung. Let me show you how they're made. When sound hits a fluid-filled alveolus, due to the air-water interface, it will bounce around chaotically and produce a continuous return of sound waves to the transducer. And the ultrasound machine interprets that as a vertical line. If you think of a continuous return of sound waves from the fluid-filled alveolus back to the transducer, this will create the vertical line that we see as a B-line, as opposed to an air-filled alveolus where you have just one returning echo, which presents as a single line, which you'll see as the pleural interface or subsequent A-lines beneath. 
Again, these lines are referred to as B lines and they indicate that the lung has too much water in it. In order for something to be called a B line, it must meet these four criteria. The line must arise from the pleural line. It has to be a vertical or laser-like line. It has to reach the bottom of the screen, which is typically 15 centimeters, and it has to move with respiration. On a side note, people used to call these comet tails. However, this is a really imprecise term that is often used incorrectly, so I advise only using the term B lines. Now that we know lung anatomy and lung artifacts, we're going to discuss specific lung pathology. Here are the four pathologic states that we'll be looking for pneumothorax, interstitial or pulmonary edema, pneumonia, or pleural effusion. And we'll go through each one of these individually. We'll start with the pneumothorax, which is diagnosed by looking for a lack of lung sliding. So you do not see the visceral and parietal pleura sliding against each other. So this is a linear probe visualizing the pectoralis muscle, some intercostal muscles, rib, and pleural line. And you'll see that there is movement along this pleural line, which indicates that the visceral and parietal pleura are sliding against each other and there is no pneumothorax. This is referred to as lung sliding or shimmering, glimmering, or even ants marching. Compare the two videos. Notice that there's lung sliding on the left side, but there's no lung sliding here on the right side. This means that the visceral and parietal pleura are not touching each other, and therefore it is likely there is a pneumothorax. However, if you want to be certain of a pneumothorax, you have to find what we call the lung point. This is the spot where the visceral and parietal pleura start to peel from each other, and you'll notice temporarily there is lung sliding on half the pleural line, and then the other half of the pleural line, there is no lung sliding. This is called the lung point, and it's pathognomonic for pneumothorax. This is an illustration of the lung point. Notice on the left part of the screen here, visceral and parietal pleura are touching, so there should be lung sliding. In the right half here, they're not touching anymore, and so you'll see a lack of lung sliding. And so this will be the lung point, again, pathognomonic for a pneumothorax. Here's one more example of a lung point. You'll notice that as the patient breathes, the two pleura touch each other intermittently, and therefore lung is intermittently visible, and then it will disappear when the two pleura do not touch each other anymore. Next, we'll talk about interstitial or pulmonary edema as indicated by B lines. We've already introduced the concept of B lines earlier, but we'll talk about specific pathologic states and we'll dive deeper into this concept. As a refresher, here are A lines. Those are the horizontal lines that are created from the reverberation artifact from the pleura and the probe skin interface. This is normal. Although A lines are normal, you still need lung sliding to indicate there is no pneumothorax. Here, we see no lung sliding along the pleural line, but we still see A-lines. So A-lines cannot be used independently to say that there is no pneumothorax. You must look for lung sliding. Here's an example of a B-line. Remember, it must arise from the pleural line. It must be a vertical laser-like line. It must reach the bottom of the screen, again, around 15 centimeters, and it should move with respiration. Here are more examples of B-lines. Notice that this one has many more B-lines than the last, and that some of them are coalescing into thicker lines. Here's one more example of B-lines. Technically, one or two B-lines is not pathologic. It's only when there's three or more B-lines do we call this pathologic. The location of the B-lines also helps to understand the significance of them. Here are the most common causes of pathologic B-lines. Increased lung water is what I mentioned earlier, but I will mention that pulmonary fibrosis can create B lines, so just be aware of that fact. If we're talking about increased lung water, pulmonary edema is the most common cause that we see. This should create bilateral B lines. The B lines should be pretty much equal in all lung zones. Infections such as pneumonia will often create unilateral B lines, but sometimes if you have multifocal pneumonia, it will create bilateral, but they're usually still patchy. ARDS will also create diffuse B lines with minimal lung sliding. Pneumonitis and pulmonary contusions in the setting of trauma will also create B lines, anything that creates fluid in the lung. As I mentioned earlier, one or two B lines can be physiologic, and they're usually found in the more dependent areas of the lung. As you have more and more fluid in your lungs, the number and density of the B lines goes up. Or stated another way, the amount of air in the alveolus goes down. 
So when you have a whiteout of the lung as seen here, there are numerous bee lines coalescing to form a, a very dense white lung. And this is severe interstitial or alveolar edema. And at some point, your lung can uh, form a consolidation where you lose your bee lines and you just get a consolidated lung seen here, which we'll describe in the next portion. So if your lung is completely full of pus or fluid, you get a lung consolidation. And we'll show you what that looks like here. Remember when you're looking for pneumonia, you have to search in three lung zones on each side, the anterior, lateral, and posterior lung zones. This can be challenging because it is more time consuming, but it's important because pneumonia can present anywhere within the lung. Here's an example of lung consolidation. This is a right costophrenic angle view. You'll see that the liver is here, there's the diaphragm, and then just above the diaphragm, you have a consolidated lung. It almost looks like there is liver above the diaphragm. Sometimes this is referred to as hepatization due to the appearance of liver. And you'll also note that the vertebral spine continues up past the diaphragm, indicating that there is stuff in the lung, and so therefore sound is able to transmit through it. Here's another example of lung consolidation. This is often referred to as the shred sign since there is a, a regular border between the consolidated lung and the aerated lung here. And finally, we finish with the subpleural consolidation. So this is a small consolidation just underneath the pleural line, which you see a irregular consolidation here, usually indicative of a bacterial pneumonia. The fourth and final lung pathology that we'll identify is the pleural effusion. We'll identify the pleural effusion by identifying the spine sign. This is when the thoracic vertebrae are now visible. Here again is the normal costophrenic angle with the visualized spleen, kidney, diaphragm, and here's the costophrenic angle here, and you do not visualize any of the thoracic vertebrae. Here's an example of a pleural effusion. You'll notice anechoic fluid above the diaphragm here, but most notably, you'll notice that the thoracic spine continues above the diaphragm here. And this is what we refer to as the spine sign, the continuation of the vertebra above the diaphragm, indicating that there is fluid or something in the thoracic cavity transmitting sound. Here's one last example of a pleural effusion with a corresponding diagram above it. You'll notice that the thoracic spine continues here, whereas on this image over here, there's no continuation of the thoracic spine. Here's one last example of a pleural effusion with a consolidated lung. Notice that you see the diaphragm here, there's anechoic fluid above it, and then you see consolidated lung that appears like the liver, again, hepatization of the lung, consistent with a consolidation. I'll spare you the details, but there's plenty of evidence to support that lung ultrasound is superior to chest x-ray for pneumothorax, pneumonia, and pulmonary edema. If you're interested, I urge you to Google it, and you can read a bunch of the references and see for yourself. So to summarize, the probe placement for lung ultrasound depends on your clinical question, whether you're looking for pneumothorax, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, or pleural effusion. The four findings that you want to look for are lung sliding, A or B lines, lung consolidation, and pleural fluid. And finally, lung ultrasound is superior for chest x-ray for all of those three diagnoses, and it's cheaper and faster.